Hi, I'm Dave from Sailing Laguna. In our last video, we finished off our travels in the Exumas by visiting Georgetown. We walked up to the monument and gazed upon the boat names people have spelt out below. We spent some time at the famous cruisers bar Chat and Chill and joined in with the lively crowd by playing some volleyball on the beach and jamming with the musos under the trees. We met Jamal, who helps all the cruisers with the basic necessities of life, and passed through the famous tunnel into Georgetown to visit the Exuma markets and the other things to see around town. All right, well, here we are at the beautiful Cape Santa Maria Resort at the north end of Long Island, over on the west coast, so it's protected from the southeasterly trade winds. So this video is going to be all about the, um, a few of the main attractions here on Long Island. So I hope you get some use out of it. Now, my mother said not to pick up, pick, pick up hitchhikers, but this looks like a good exception. Our first destination was to the Columbus Monument, which recognises that Columbus pulled into the Northern Bay at Long Island in 1492. I quite liked how the monument recognised the gentle, peaceful native Lucayan Indians. Less than 30 years after Columbus's arrival, there were no more native inhabitants of the Bahamas, with the majority taken to other nations as slaves or died from diseases. The Bahamas were then uninhabited for the next hundred odd years. After that, pirates, loyalists and their slaves colonised the Bahamas to become the nation that we know today. Yes. What's significant about when Christopher Columbus arrived in the Bahamas? Five days before my birthday. Is it? Five days before your birthday? Now they call it Long Island for a reason. It's quite a long drive from Cape Santa Maria down to the tourist attractions. You should use this time to Google Hamilton's Caves Tours and call Leonard, or whoever is running it those in these days, uh, to arrange a time. We met Leonard at his house, which is situated on the main road. He then led us up to the cave and his stash of banana trees. Wow, look at all the bananas. The cave has a long history, as you would expect, being used by the Lukayan Indians then settlers as early as 1865. Being a limestone cave, it has a few stalactites and stalagmites growing, but not as many as what you would think for a cave as large as this. Leonard showed us the three types of bats that are currently in the cave, but there could be as many as five and said that there's large numbers of migrating bats arrive in, or oh, maybe it was April. At 70, it's safe to say Leonard has been through this cave a few times, and he does a good job of pointing out the similarities between the natural limestone formations and other creatures. Hamilton's cave is one of the must-dos on Long Island, so make sure you make time for it. It seems like a very religious um, island. It's only a short distance away from Clarence Town, which is a nice location for lunch where you can overlook the various shades of blue in the bay and you might even see a shark or two at the local marina. Unfortunately, at the time we visited, the marina was not very accommodating to cruisers who wanted to come in to the chandlery or restaurant. We heard reports and experienced firsthand that they would not let us tie our tender up. We had to tie up at the public wharf across the bay and walk into the restaurant. Now, it's not too difficult, but it's a shame that the marina couldn't be more accommodating given that half of their berths are empty. We didn't have time, but apparently you can climb the church at Clarence Town. But our next visit was to Dean's Blue Hole. That is not 
You don't need a four-wheel drive, well at the moment anyway, but take it slowly and follow the signs down to the car park. You will then find a white beach with a stunning backdrop of cliffs towering over the mesmerising Dean's Blue Hole. I'll stand over there, At 202 metres deep, it's the world's second deepest blue hole. It's actually the shape of a bell jar being three times as wide as what you see at the top. Apparently blue holes are eroded in ice ages and will eventually fill up with sand, but for some reason there's some that seem to take a long time to do so. It certainly felt a bit weird with the depth seemingly dropping off to infinity as you swim out into the middle. It's also popular with scuba divers, but after speaking with one of them, it's not that exciting as there isn't really much to see. Probably a, probably a dive for a regular enthusiast rather than someone who only does a couple of dives a year. Anyway, Dean's Blue Hole is another must do for Long Island. Uh, give us a thumbs up, Campbell. Now, if you need to fill in some time on your way south, you can stop at the Shrimp Hole. It's not overly impressive, but as I said, to fill in time. Just look for the sign and the old church. Then make your way around the back, follow the signs to the shrimp hole. What is it, Campbell? Look at the big size of the cave. It's not going to blow you away, and I don't know if you should swim in there or not, as the shrimp are apparently in danger. Sure you don't want to go for a swim? If you're a cruiser, you probably want to stop at the hillside store. It's kind of like a TARDIS. Once inside, you will find all sorts of random things. Think Walmart, but in a telephone booth. It even had Cadbury's chocolate, something we, didn't, we couldn't find in the US. Also, on the way home, if you ever imagine yourself running a little bar on some bohemian beach, then you need to check out Tiny's at Salt Pond. We found it when we sought shelter from a front in Thompson Bay. It was a little like the old university days when the bar ran out of margaritas and then ran out of Tiny's tonics and it actually happened for two days in a row when the girls drank the bar dry. What do we think of Tiny's? Hey. One of those boats is the famous YouTube sailing channel, the O'Kellys. I got to have a chat with them at Tiny's. It's a shame I didn't get a photo. I guess I was too shy. If you can recall the significance of the other boat, then please comment below. Think back to like episode 26. It's then back to the amazing Cape Santa Maria Resort. Well, back to the tender anyway. You probably can't quite see it with the sunlight in the background. But the Cape Santa Maria Resort is actually very welcoming to the yachties. So there's lots of cruisers that are anchored out the front here. Um, they can come in to shore, they can, have, um, they can have meals and drinks and everything like that um, at the restaurant bar. So yeah, it's a great spot for cruisers as well. Currently in April 2021, there's also the Cape Santa Maria Tower to check out. So let's go and have a look at that. Arr, Campbell! Are we be finding a tower to look out for pirates? Yes. Yeah. Okay, enjoy the views. Pure advertising genius to erect this tower for, and let people climb it uh, to let them know that your land is for sale. You never know what wealthy people might be in the resort or at the, at the anchorage for that matter. Well, it's time to say bye-bye to Calabash Bay. Um, I was in two minds as to whether we should stay here in the nor'easter that's coming. Uh, there are reports that it gets a bit rolly, but I guess our mind has been made up when basically the anchorage has gone from 20 odd boats here down to one lonely little sailboat, which I don't know whether he's got the, the ability to move anyway by the looks of his head sail. 
But yeah, the anchorage is basically completely cleared out now except for that guy. Uh, lots of people have headed down to Thompson Bay. Some have gone over to Georgetown or back to Georgetown, probably because they're heading north. But yeah, it looks like uh, everyone's, by everyone's actions, it looks as though Calabash is not the place to be in a nor'easter. Now for the less glamorous parts of cruising life. We had a few issues getting to Long Island. Firstly, I heard a spraying water sound and found a burst water hose in our bathroom. This is not the first time this has happened, and usually this would not be much of an issue. However, the braided hose has a thread that I've not been able to find in the US or the Bahamas. I had to use another hose from the laundry tap, and then I had to block the laundry tap off with by sticking a bolt down through the hose and clamping it off. I wouldn't find a replacement braided hose with the correct thread until I actually got to French St. Martin. And when I did, I purchased every one of them that was left on the shelf. I mean, remember, this boat has six taps, therefore 12 braided hoses that all probably will need replacement at some time. Now, you may recall last video in Georgetown that I rebuilt one of the raw water pumps with new bearings and seals. I also mentioned that I didn't do it successfully. So, firstly, when I reinstalled the water pump, it wouldn't draw water. Every time I tried to fill the system with water, it would suck air in somewhere, which would cause some type of airlock and prevent the pump from working. It would work fine if I did manage to prime it, but a few minutes after the engine was turned off, it would need repriming. We seem to have partly solved this issue by sand sanding down the raw water pump cover, which had a few wear marks in it. The engines have got, you know, about four and a half thousand hours on them now. And again, about St. Martin, I eventually found the raw water pump cover sitting on the shelf at Budget Marine. You'll hear more about how good St. Martin is for fixing things in a future video. Yes, I'm that far behind at the moment with editing. Anyway, then when we did get the engine working, we used it on the way to Long Island and it threw a pulley. I don't know if I didn't seat the pulley correctly, or if I over tightened the belt too much, or if the nylock nut just didn't have enough bite on it on, uh, with the thread of the bolt. Anyway, the hot water alarm went off on the engine and I shut it down immediately. Uh, we were only about an hour out of Long Island at that stage. Then we had to wait for almost two weeks for a new pulley to turn up to Long Island. We had to get it specially flown in, which is a whole other story. And well, it was actually pretty depressing being stuck there. We did manage to motor around the island on one engine because luckily catamarans have two, but there is a saying that boats and people rot in the harbour, and so it's not enjoyable being stuck in the one spot. Anyway, that just about does it for Long Island. So join us next time as we start our journey along what is called the Thorny Path, the series of passages to the Caribbean, with the first leg to the Dominican Republic. So, see you then.